Thank you to, to Mel and Joan and all of you, the chapter here and all of you, and thank you for being here on this, not only is it Halloween, but it's a gorgeous night out there. It's kind of frightening, I know, it shouldn't be this warm, but it is kind of nice to to one level just to put your head up into this beautiful warm uh, night, and I do want to thank you and forgive the running shoes. I just, uh, the, my plane was two hours late. I was going to go to the hotel and change and look more grown up, but there you are. This is, this is the way I travel. Uh, we, the plane needed new brakes. I'm certainly glad they stopped and got the new brakes. We actually had to wait for the brakes. I was, I was in uh, Yellowknife this morning and so flew to Edmonton and because I had stuff in the morning so I couldn't fly directly here. And, um, and uh, so they had to wait for the brakes to come in on another plane and then we had to sit in the, and watch them get put in the plane which is like, okay, now we're going to test the brakes by getting in this plane. We made not bad time till we got to Calgary and then we just circled around and around because it's so busy here and I felt so badly there were easily 20 people on the plane who had uh, flights to Frankfurt and London that weren't going to make it. So, yeah, so anyway, I'm just delighted to be here and forgive the running shoes. Um, we can't see them. Okay, here they are. <laughs> here they are. Uh, I'm just going to talk at you for a little while and then hopefully we can um, have a conversation. I'm you know that we're here partly also to put on an alternative event tomorrow evening uh, for uh, to represent uh, an alternative point of view to the Conservative Party's uh, policy convention. Um, and we're going to be talking about many, many issues, but one of them is what the Harper government has done to water. I've just come from Yellowknife, and they're really putting up a huge fight against a massive proje uh, projected uh, fracking operation. And as we're finding everywhere, they've allowed ConocoPhillips, in this case it's ConocoPhillips, it could be one of so many, um, to come in and they're not going to do, not only not going to do an environmental assessment, even though that violates the Northwest Territories Environmental uh, Assessment, uh, Environmental <coughs> Rights Act, uh, they're, not, they're not going to force the company to disclose the chemicals uh, in, 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 in you know, we know what these chemicals are, but we should, well, we don't know exactly which chemicals they're going to use, but we've no, we know from studies of fracked sites what the chemicals are. And basically, at least a quarter of them are carcinogens. Um, there are endocrine disruptors. I mean, these are really dangerous chemicals. One major study found over 600 chemicals in the, in the fracked wells in, in New York State. Um, but, and then this, uh, yesterday the National Energy Board gave the go-ahead without the environmental assessment and without uh, the disclosure of chemicals for this process to move. So this is part of a process that we're seeing across the country. I stood in solidarity with the Elsie Puktuk, that's how the, you say the name of the First Nation in New Brunswick that's been standing up to the fracking there and the violence that occurred, um, uh, you know, the, the, the assault on, on, on them that took place, but I've been there several times, um, standing up with them as have our council chapters, as have lots of local community people, uh, because they have not had their right to free prior and informed consent honored. Um, they're just allowing 20% of New Brunswick's um, uh, land mass to be uh, f uh, uh, tested for se seismic testing for fracking. And so I wrote an op-ed piece that was uh, published in their paper saying that your government's planning to make you the uh, Pennsylvania of, of Canada, you know, with, where Pennsylvania 10 years ago, if you took a, a satellite photo, it was just farms and wilderness, right? And now it's just all lit up like, a, 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 you, know, the, you know, a big city because it's just fracking everywhere and, and with the attendant uh, disruptions of... of uh, people's health, uh, the animals are sick, they've had um, uh, poisoned water, they have methane uh, in, their, in, their, in their drinking water, they have earthquakes, I mean, it's just a terrible story. Uh, so these, this is all part of a massive um, extraction, exploitation grab that the Harper government is allowing and that most of our provincial governments and territorial governments are going along with it. They're not fighting it, they're going along with it. And it's really important to note that we, ha the Harper government in those omnibus bills killed every single serious piece of legislation protecting our freshwater heritage from the Fisheries Act, which was gutted, to the Navigable Waters Protection Act, to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. When they, took, when they gutted the last one, 3,000 environmental assessments that were being done at the time were dropped from the books. And this is just really appalling and unacceptable. 
Uh, with the changes to the Navigable Waters Protection Act, 99% of the rivers and lakes in Canada are no longer protected from any pipeline carrying the dirtiest oil on earth um, going, moving under, over, or around them. And they're also moving uh, fossil fuels, diluted bitumen, shale gas, fracked shale gas, and oil now by, by tanker trucks, by, by um, rail, of course, massive increase, 800% increase in, in, uh, in uh, rail transport of these fossil fuels. And now we're finding out by barge and ships across the Great Lakes, which we're going to do some research on in our organization because we want to get some hard numbers there. But I mean, there's this bitumen bubble here in Alberta. And the slowdown in the, in the pipelines is, has meant that they're just shipping it any way that they can get it out there. And it's important to note that Lac Megantic was one of the lakes that was delisted from protection under the um, Navigable Waters Protection Act. So we really do have a, a terrible situation in our country where basically all of the laws that we have have been gutted. And we, have, uh, we know that this came from the energy industry itself. We have the letter from the energy industry to the government saying these are the laws we want you to remove, they're an impediment to our, our funding, our, our, our profit, uh, bottom line profit. Um, and at the same time, the government is moving to open up extractive industries, whether it's coal or uh, liquid gas or fracking or expansion of the tar sands and so on, with no thought to where we could start to move toward an alternative energy future. And uh, where I'm very concerned about the energy and the air part of it, I'm also deeply concerned about what this is doing to water. And it's really important for us to recognize that it is First Nations who now have basically the only governance structure left that's protecting us in terms of water because they have their treaty rights, they have their rights under the human right to water and sanitation, they have their rights to free prior and informed consent under the uh, Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So it's really more important than ever that we work hand in hand with First Nations because they have what's left of the protections uh, when all of the rest have been uh, taken away. And you put that together with these new trade and investment agreements. Uh, this CETA, this Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, where, which the CBC says only a few dairy farmers oppose, which is just an insult. That's what the CBC said yesterday. Well, in fact, let me tell you, there's a, vi a big and growing movement against um, this agreement as people understand what's in it. And there are many things to be concerned about. But two, from a water perspective, is one, uh, corporations from Europe are now going to have the same right that American corporations have under NAFTA to sue um, if any level of government brings in environmental regulations or health regulations or whatever, that they say, well, that's going to hurt our bottom line. Um, we have a legal opinion that shows that if Alberta were to say to all of the energy companies operating here, you have to half your water intake because we're running out of water, which Alberta is, um, they'd all have to obey it. But the foreign companies that ha are protected by these investor state uh, agreements would have the right to sue for compensation up to millions and potentially billions of dollars. So this right is going to now extend to all the corporations of Europe, and it's also going to extend to corporations in China if uh, the government signs this agreement, this foreign investment and uh, pro protection and promotion agreement that they're talking about. So basically, it's a one, two, three. You deregulate. Then you let the energy and mining companies in. Uh, and by the way, they're going to, under the CETA, they're going to remove the foreign ownership restrictions on uranium mining. So we're going to see, again, transnational corporations from other countries with investor state protections being able to come in and own um, our, our uranium mines. Um, and so try, try then controlling them and, and what happens to them. Uh, so it, so you, get, you get this one, two, three punch where these corporations then have fundamental rights to basically dictate policy in Canada. And if a future government comes in, if a more progressive government comes in to power, wants to reinstate the Fisheries Act, wants to reinstate the Navigable Waters Protection Act, and so on, these corporations could say, well, that, those were not the conditions under which we invested. Um, and you, we're, you know, we're fighting this. We, we, we don't want this, and we want to be paid compensation. So that locks us into that kind of corporate, extractive industry, unlimited growth model. The other issue to be concerned around about CETA is that uh, the uh, gov again, the Harper government wants to move to privatized water services. 
And so what they're doing is they, they are saying to the municipalities, if you want to, if you want money, federal funding for infrastructure, new infrastructure, or, or um, you know, upgrading your 100-year-old pipes and so on, you can only get it if you move to public-private partnerships. And so a uh, number of municipalities across the country have been told they have to do this or they forfeit federal money. Now, we won in Abbotsford, uh, British Columbia, the people there not only said no to the federal money and privatization, but they kicked the mayor and the city council out. But unfortunately, we had a big battle in Regina, and the city council spent $400,000 of taxpayers' money just pouring this publicity out to the people, saying it's wonderful, it's the best thing since sliced bread, anyway, it's only your wastewater, as if somehow wastewater is separate from our watershed, right? Um, and we had a referendum that we lost. So, um, you know, this is going to grow now. Now, if now one of the, the companies bidding on it are two of the companies bidding in Regina are the two largest uh, utility corporations in the world. They're both from France, and if this CETA is signed, they will have the same right to sue uh, the municipality of Regina or the government of Canada if the municipality of Regina in five years changes its mind, as, as communities are doing around the world. So this is when we say that these agreements lock in a privatized system, a system that is put in place by the 1% for the 1%, um, you know, that, 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 that serves a, a, an agenda of unlimited growth and profit for these companies, they really do lock it in. And we, we not only have to fight this agreement, but we have to put the, the, the opposition parties on notice that we want to hear strongly from them what they're going to do about this and to really understand um, the, you know, the, the power and the danger of these investor state um, agreements. So that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about. Surely I'll be speaking about this issue in, in, in my remarks and in, in what I want to say, but we have to stand here and speak uh, our truth to the, to the Harper government on a whole range of issues, from the fact that they're going to remove the federal uh, funding over time from health care to the, their stand on human rights to the weakening of Canada's position against torture. I mean, I can list so many areas that we, where we are being brought into a very, very different future in Canada, where this government is, is setting the tone to, to fundamentally and permanently change our country. And we need to know if the opposition parties are going to undo the damage that has been done. So I want to talk about water in my book, but I really do, I did want to kind of get that off my chest because I'm really, I'm here to fight. I, I get, I got up and I ate some nails for breakfast this morning, so... <laughs> I would have my iron to fight uh, the Harper government, but I really think we need to be clear in our minds about why this man is dangerous, why this government is dangerous, what they're doing to our country, and how, it's going, how hard it's going to be to undo if we don't stop the damage now. And I'm hoping that we can speak to some of those red Tories and some of those Tories who surely must care about uh, issues like water and surely there shouldn't be a left-right issue when, when your water systems are being decimated. So whether we can, oh and just one last thing to say about water and this CETA, they're going to allow an, an, a new threshold of, of over 70,000 um, uh, head of cattle, uh, um, uh, sorry, 70,000 tons of, of beef to be exported into Europe duty-free and more than that of pigs and hogs, but certainly the beef is an issue here in Alberta. And I did an analysis of the amount of water that would take, and we simply don't have the water in this province to expand the beef industry to supply Europe. We simply don't have it. But it's as if there's the trade people over here, and then there's the farm and agriculture people over here, and there's the economic department over here, and then way over here are maybe two people left standing who know anything about water, and nobody asks them, you know, what would be the impact of what we're doing on water. Now, the reason this matters, and what is the subject of the book, is that we are a planet running out of water. And we all learned back in grade six that this wasn't possible. We all learn, we all have that diagram in our head about the hydrologic cycle. It goes round and round. It's like a big river. You can stick your straw in the river, right? Um, and our teachers weren't lying to us. That it, it is true there's a, a finite specific amount of water. It's true it goes through the hydrologic cycle. But what we now know is that we're able to mismanage, uh, pollute, and most importantly, displace water from where we can access it to where we can no longer access it. 
We are um, uh, damming our rivers to death. We are extracting them so that most of them don't reach the ocean anymore. We are pulling up ancient groundwater, fossil groundwater, at a rate that is absolutely unsustainable so that, and again, there are tons of studies on this and I document it very carefully here, so that we are, are literally running out of groundwater in many, many parts of the world. Just a chilling statistic from China, they, they counted in the 1960s over 50,000 <coughs> major rivers, and they, over a certain uh, volume and size. There are now 23,000 rivers in China left. They're, they have destroyed, they have disappeared. I'm not talking about pollution, they've done that too. They have, they, they, over half of the rivers in China are gone. They're gone. The Aral Sea, which was the biggest, uh, one of the, the fourth biggest lake in the world in the old Soviet Union, was pumped to grow cotton. It's basically gone. Lake Chad, the sixth largest lake in the world in Africa, basically gone. This study on global study on groundwater said that if we're pumping the Great Lakes at the same merciless uh, level that we're pumping groundwater around the world, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years. Now, don't you think that would have deserved a front page uh, of the Globe and Mail? Maybe? No, no, didn't, didn't, didn't reach the front page of anything. It was in a nature magazine. The Ogallala Aquifer, that's the big uh, aquifer that runs down the spine of the United States that produces most of their food and also $20 billion worth of exports every year is being pumped mercilessly because in the 1950s they discovered a form of circular bore well technology that allows them, you know when you fly over you see those rings, those, those uh, crop rings, that's what they are. Uh, it's a circular um, uh, flood irrigation system and they're pulling up that water mercilessly. There are over 200,000 bore well pumps going 24-7. Uh, and they're producing a massive amounts of corn, 40% of which now, by law in the United States, has to go to biofuels. Biofuels take a huge amount of water to produce, 1,700 uh, liters of water for one liter of corn ethanol that you get from it. So we're, again, we're, we're the Department of, U.S. Department of Agriculture said two years ago, again, I expected this to be headlines all over North America, the Ogallala Aquifer will be gone in our lifetime. That was the, that, that's the statement. I got it in the book. I, I mean, I've got the quote and the source and everything. That is a very disturbing thing to hear because this means that a massive aquifer that was once the biggest in the world is going to be gone within our lifetime. So I don't think I can say strongly to you enough here tonight that we have a, a global crisis. We have a crisis where the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. If you look at the graphs, it's like a straight arrow up and a straight arrow down. Um, one last study to tell you about, this was done by the big agribusiness companies and the big bottled water companies. They said that by 2030, which isn't very far away, that the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%. Now, we have a lot of suffering in the world as we stand now. In the global south, more children die of waterborne disease than all forms of violence, including war. It is the number one killer. And in every single case, these kids would not be dying if their parents had money to buy water for them because it is an issue where the water's been privatized or there just isn't any accessible clean water and it has to be uh, pumped in, uh, brought in from somewhere else or bottled water or whatever. Um, but I want you to know it's not just in the Global South where this is happening. Uh, there are many thousands of, of families in inner city Detroit, which has gone bankrupt, as you know, who've had their water cut off. And they are, they, they estimate, about 90,000 people. And they get up in the morning and they go out with their buckets and their pots and pans and they go to public buildings and they fill them up and they come home just like people in Africa and countries where we have this image of this happening. Uh, Europe, one of the uh, measures around the austerity measure, or one of the prerequisites of, of, of debt reduction uh, with their austerity measure is um, privatization of water services and the dramatic increase in the price of water and people are being cut off in Europe. So it is not just in the global south as we find these great differences between rich and poor in our world and the price of water goes up, particularly as water becomes commodified, put on the open market more like oil and gas, which is 
you know, fast becoming a goal of the corporate sector, we are going to see more and more people having to make choices around um, water and basic food, basic water, basic rent, that kind of thing in the global north as well. So it's a huge ecological issue and it's a huge environmental or, or uh, human rights issue. And the work that we've been doing in our movement has tried to put these issues together to say that you have to look at them together, you have to analyze them together, you can't just look at the ecological issue, nor can you look simply at the development human rights issue unless you put them together. You don't understand, if we don't understand that the planet's running out of clean water and we think just building some more wells and allowing the continued pollution of surface water, is, if we think that's an answer, we're wrong. And so we need to build something very different. I, I, I propose in my book um, a solution based on four principles, and I call for a new water ethic. And this water ethic, I argue, has to say that we, we have to stop thinking of water as a resource for our personal pleasure, profit, and convenience, and rather see water as the essential element of a living ecosystem that gives us life. And that means a profound change in the way we think, the way we feel, the way we experience water, the way we experience nature. We have to stop thinking of ourselves at the top of some you know, chain and stop seeing all of it serving us. Um, I, I, I think one of the big problems was when we first had taps and you could turn on a tap and this thing came out of, uh, this lovely water came out and you didn't have to go and fetch it and haul it home and you didn't have to heat it up and you didn't have to chip ice and you didn't have to touch the stuff. You didn't have to have a, an understanding of where it came from. I remember one of the first times I was in a really poor community and this was in Bolivia and, and came home and I counted, I'm not rich, we're, we're middle class, and I counted all the taps and like all the water sources in my house. Well, there's the outside hoses front and back and there's the kitchen sink and there's the laundry and there's the bathtub and the showers and, and the toilets and the taps and I had like 11 or something and I could turn them all on and just leave them on and this lovely clean water would come out and, and I, I, it was just such a revelation to me, you know, that we take it so for granted. So uh, we need a new water ethic and that water ethic has to say for every policy and every practice, what is the impact on water? And if the impact is negative, we either have to dump that policy or we have to fundamentally change it. And I, I try to imagine a world where our policymakers would actually ask that question. But I do believe that it's actually possible that we're going to come, we're going to, come to that point very soon. In Australia, they're already there. I mean, they ask the question around water for everything because they have no choice. We in Canada still think of ourselves as living with this abundance, this myth of abundance, and so don't do it. And so this water ethic, I would argue, needs to be based on four principles, and then I'm going to shut up and talk with you, not at you. The first is that water is a human right. And you might say to me, well, that's a, a motherhood, of course it's a human right. And I will tell you, we fought two decades to get the United Nations to recognize the human right to water and sanitation. And it really happened in a way because a, a, a series of, of things came together. A wonderful man named Michael Descato Brockman, who was a, a theolo liberation theologian priest from Nicaragua, became the 63rd president of the UN General Assembly. He'd read my work. He asked me to advise him on how we move this forward. And then we then grabbed Pablo Solon, who was the ambassador from, from Bolivia at the time, uh, and we plotted out how we were going to do this. And, and Pablo put forward a resolution to the UN General Assembly uh, that was adopted, overwhelmingly voted for, on July 28th, um, 2010. Canada led the fight against it. It was just mortifying to be at the UN and have people saying, well, I, I like everything you're saying, but how, you know, but, but your government, your government, just appalling, really. Um, but it was very, and the, the, day that, the day that it happened, the, the, the vote took place, because I didn't think we were going to win. I thought we were going to lose. And so I was holding hands with some of our staff and saying, I will be back in a couple of years, don't worry. And overwhelmingly, 122 countries voted in favor. No country voted against, 41, including Canada, abstained. And then one after another, they started lecturing Pablo. Um, 
he was up in the balcony with me and a group of us, and he had his arms folded. And he was just grinning from ear to ear. They were saying, you know, you know, we weren't ready, and you shouldn't have pushed this, and you know, like all these kids are dying, but they need more research, right? And and uh, Pablo just looked at them as if to say, you know, what part of I just won and you didn't? <laughs> Do you not understand? I mean, it was a a very interesting moment. Um, and we've had some real wins since, some, some, uh, some legal wins, including uh, uh, the use of this by the Kalahari Bushmen of, of Botswana, who used this right to get, regain their right to go back to the desert and have their water, their boreholes reopened. A number of countries have amended their constitutions and so on. So we took a, a giant leap forward, an evolutionary step forward as a human species when that day that that happened. But Making it real on the ground in this country means making it real for First Nations, where, where the situation for um, water and sanitation continues to be appalling. That's the first. The second is that water is a public trust and a common heritage. And this, this principle basically says that it's not, water is not like, you know, I don't know, pencils or running shoes, that it is, it is not only a basic human right, but it is a, a, a public. It's a public trust. It's um, uh, a public service, and it must be. It must be fiercely managed uh, by all of us for the future, for the ecosystem, for other species who cannot speak for themselves to protect the water, um, and that no one has the right to appropriate it for personal profit while others are doing without. And that that notion is extremely important. That we say it's a public trust. Uh, that it's going to be um, guarded by government or government agency, but on behalf of the people who are the caretakers. We are the caretakers, and, and uh, it's not to be used in the way that it's been used. And you need to know that under the human right to, uh, to water, governments are obliged to stop third parties from polluting or destroying local water sources. So we really need to, we really need to start thinking uh, much more aggressively about our fundamental rights to, to what this clean water means. Just real quick example, Vermont uh, had no uh, legislation uh, support, um, um, uh, protecting its groundwater and four years ago I worked with them and they brought in uh, legislation to protect their groundwater. They unanimously adopted it, uh, Republican and Democratic uh, parties together. And then they used it to force a, um, a nuclear uh, waste co or nuclear company that was dumping its tritium into a local water stream, and was saying, "Well, that's our water. We have the water rights to it." And the and this, uh, you know, they were able to turn around and say, "No, no. The new law says this water belongs to us, the people of Vermont, and the future. And you cannot do that anymore to this water." So you can actually set priorities, who gets access to water and the conditions under which they would have access to that water, including you can't over-extract it, you can't pollute it, and so on. The third uh, principle is that water has rights too. And this takes this whole concept of protecting water a step further in that it says that water and nature have rights beyond their usefulness to us. Uh, and that we have to start making our human laws more compatible with the laws of nature. We tend to see water as a resource, it's property. The only way you can get compensation, for instance, if you're a victim of the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico, is if you can prove that your job, your livelihood, or your home was damaged. Forget the fact that the entire ecosystem was damaged for potentially decades to come, maybe longer. Uh, there's no re recompense for that. So we need to stop thinking about it in this way. And we have worked, a bunch of us, on a document called the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother on the Rights of Mother Earth, um, which is a very moving document, which some of us would like to see one day being the companion piece to the Universal Declaration on the Rights of, uh, of Human Rights um, as a, a statement of principle that we're not the only ones who have rights here. And this is controversial, I'll tell you. People, when, when we first came out, somebody in Fox News said, oh, these people would, would uh, you know, go to, go to court to, for cockroaches and stuff. Like, and, you know, you won't be allowed to fish anymore. And, of course, that's not true. But you wouldn't be allowed to fish a species to extinction. I mean, the, the, the concept would be you would be, yes, you can take water, but you cannot destroy a watershed with the takings that you are, 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 are you know, have undertaken. 
Um, and then the fourth and last principle is basically that water um, can teach us how to live together. And this principle basically asks the question, in a plant, with a planet where the demand is growing, and remember we're going to have 9 to 10 billion people on the planet by 2050 unless something catastrophic happens, on a planet where the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down, are we going to have more conflict? Are we going to have violence? Are we going to have war? Or are we going to find a way to say that water could be exactly the opposite, that it could be nature's gift to teach us how to live together with one another? Is it possible that we can say, instead of saying, well, my father hated your father and his father hated his father and therefore I'm supposed to hate you, can we say instead, um, uh oh, <laughs> this river is dying or this watershed is, is in crisis and maybe we should stop talking about what our fathers and grandfathers thought about each other and start talking together about how we can govern this watershed in a watershed manner, um, how we can see water as a potential tool for peace. And there are actually wonderful examples from around the world where water is being used to bring communities together as opposed to pulling communities apart. But there are ways we have to think about it if we're going to set out to um, share resources in a fundamentally different way. Essentially, we have to take care of water and we have to share it more justly and equitably or we are going to be a planet where the water crisis is going to overtake um, much else in our world. Um, so it's um, what I'm hoping to do with the book and with, the, with the, the themes that I'm promoting is to offer to people an offer, wouldn't it be lovely, to governments maybe or to the United Nations or to anyone um, studying this in universities and so on, a blueprint for moving ahead because I think we're really ready to think about the next steps and how, and, and, and how we take them and what we do. And I just end with um, one quick story, and that is because I've watched, I've watched in my lifetime, I've watched a lot of changes, sea changes in people's um, thinking and, and attitudes. I remember in the 1980s in the House of Commons, a woman member of Parliament made a strong statement about wife assault, and a lot of the guys thought that was very funny and pounded the table and laughed, and they wouldn't do that today. <laughs> you know, or drinking and driving, or same-sex marriage, and, or, or you know, same-sex rights. I mean, these are all fundamental changes that we've seen in our, in our lifetime. People can change. I remember when they used to smoke on planes, if you can believe it. No, really, you get off and you just stink. So we can change. And I believe that what we need is a sea change in our attitude around, well, nature generally, but in this case around waters. So I just want to tell you one nice story. We were very involved with a fight in a place called Simcoe County, which is a beautiful farming community up north of Toronto, north, northwest of Barrie, uh, up on Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. And it is prime A farmland. And they found there's a, an aquifer called the Alliston Aquifer that has been tested in a lab in Germany to have the cleanest water that's ever been tested. So what do you do with the cleanest water in the world? you decide to put a huge four-cell dump site on it. They decided this a couple of decades ago. Now, the, the county council is made up of the mayors of all these small villages because there's no big city there. And then they elect a warden, so it's like, kind of like a chief mayor. And for, for you know, almost 20 years, this, this fight's been going on. Uh, with the local community trying to stop it and, you know, doing everything in their power legally and bringing in politicians and so on. Five years, four years ago, four summers ago, they ran out of all their, their, their uh, options, thank you, and their ammo. And so the, the local council said, we're moving ahead. Um, and they started bringing in the big heavy equipment. They had confiscated the farmland. They had put cement, uh, they covered most of it in cement. It was just awful. You could hear the birds, you know, the, the, sound, of the sound of the birds dying and so on. Um, and we got very involved in it. And so did a group of, of First Nations women from a First Nations community there called the Beausoleil First Nations. So what they did was they set up a a campsite, a peace camp, and a sacred fire on the adjoining farmer's property with his blessing. Um, and so they camped there all summer, and so that became the focal point. And the, the women and local supporters in the community would just happen 
to hold these prayer vigils just would happen to be around 5.30 in the morning as the big trucks came in, and it would just happen to be in the roads so that the trucks couldn't get by. So this standoff got really tense, and they held it off. They held off the, tr the, the, the building of the first cell for five weeks until it was too late. And by, the, by that time, they knew that the, the frost was going to move in before they got finished, so they had to stop for the summer. So the county warden, who's an awful guy, started arresting them, sending the police, and they were arresting these young mothers, and they arrested this a woman who was in her 80s. She and her husband are farmers, and they came to the door to get her, and she was baking butter tarts for the church bazaar. This is my favorite story. <laughs> and so she used to be a, a teacher, and she knew these kids, and she was the young men, these, um, but she'd known them as kids. And she invited them in for butter tarts and tea, and then said, then we'll go to the police station. So of course, we used the occasion to call the, poli uh, to call the press, eh, to call the media. <laughs> So there was all this media, she was taken away, and they, they asked her what she thought, and she said, look, I've never had so much as a, a parking ticket, but she said, if I'm going down, I'm going down for water. It was really quite wonderful. I knew then we were going to win. So we got the county council to agree to have a vote on a moratorium to give us a year, and we figured if we could get that, then we would stop it. And so it was held on the end of August um, four years ago, and it was held in, it's in the country setting in this, in this county council, it looks like a big courthouse. There must have been, and I'm not kidding you, 16 or 1700 people from the community. Cars lined up along these country roads as far as you could see. Three or 400 were able to get into the balcony and into the, you know, to, to watch it. The rest had to stay outside and we put up big loudspeakers for them. Um, and it was raucous. It was the Globe and Mail was there, and the CBC and CTV. It was became a real David and Goliath story, and people were throwing buns from the balcony. <laughs> it was like real democracy, right? Uh, so we didn't know which way the vote was going to go. There were two really important um, uh, mayors from these 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 small villages. One was a woman who was going to speak on our side. And one was the mayor of a, a township called Tiny Township, and he was a very big, tough guy. <laughs> A retired businessman who used to just love going out and fighting these protesters. And he used to just love saying, you know, I, I, what was the saying? Um, uh, get up early, beat a protester. He thought that was very funny. So he was going to give the statement for, for, it's called Site 41 for this, uh, against the moratorium. So we thought, well, depending on how eloquent they are, one of them is going to sway the undecided. So she, our, our woman got up and she was wonderful. I uh, mean, lots of clapping and so on. And then he got up to speak, and everybody was just, here we go, right? Starts to cry. Starts to sob. You can hear a pin drop, and I mean outside, too. It's just total silence, because this big, tough mayor of Tiny Township has started to cry. And he said, when I got up this morning, I was going to come in here and fight for my, for my dump site, fight against you guys. And he went like this to the balcony. And he said, then I went into my my office at home uh, and my grandchildren had found one of the stop site 41 signs that are all over the county and they put it on my desk and they wrote the word papa on it and he said in that moment my grandchildren changed my job description and i became a steward of the water of simcoe county and he said as long uh as i live site 41 will never open and it it um it was it's been sold back it's been made prime farmland again and last summer, it was sold to a farm family, and we went there and walked through the fields and heard the birds singing again. Uh, it was an, a marvelous, marvelous uh, feeling. And this was a, a, a true story of true change. And I think what happened to him has to happen to a lot of people. Am I holding my breath for it to happen to Stephen Harper? No. <laughs> uh, but am I holding, holding my breath that it happens to enough people that we make these fundamental changes? You bet. We have to do it. Uh, we're stewards of the water. It's up to us. We're stewards of, of what people have fought so hard for before us. And this is our watch. We have to, we have to care for these things on our, steward, on, our, on our watch. But then, what else have we got to do? So thank you so much.
I'm sure Maud will take some questions, uh, but but I just I'm going to referee it. So so you'll have to put your hand up, and I'll acknowledge you, and and give you a number to ask a question. I'm sort of slow at this, so I'm going to give Maud a breather while she does this uh, or, or thinks about it. I want you to stand up when you ask your question <laughs> and speak loudly because we haven't got a roving mic. We have a roving mic, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so if you want the roving mic just to sort of ab lib, I can give you that. But otherwise, please stand up, ask your question, try to keep it short and succinct. And we'll take questions for 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll go to book signing. Is that okay? Okay. 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 Go ahead. Do I need a mic? Turn around. There's no mic. No mic. I live in a province that is very pro business, pro oil. I have met people who work in the oil industry. And they're confused. They are for water rights. They're against what the oil company is doing. But at the same time, they are for what the oil company is doing in a dilemma. And I am happy that I'm not working for the oil industry. I used to work at one time, and I got out because of the mentality. But I feel intimidated as a writer on these issues, living in the city especially. I'll question. stay in Edmonton. Question. The question is, what can we do about it in Calgary versus Edmonton that is so different from Calgary, although it's in the same province, Alberta? I need help for that. <laughs> well, yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah. I'm not that good looking. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you're right. Oh, yeah. Um, this is to you, obviously. I was wondering if Maude would comment on uh, the political condition that's going on right now about public money being used to promote private interests. Like, you referenced the $400,000 by the Regina Council, or $24 million taken by the Conservative government to promote the approval of the XL pipeline, or the 100 some million dollars to promote uh, studies about the impact about a potential disaster for the Northern Gateway Pipeline tanker traffic that's going to be happening off the coast. This is all public money. And I'm just wondering if you would care to offer an opinion to blunt this strategy of Thank using you. public Thank money. Thank you. We got a question, Susan. <laughs> Um, this is a local issue, and I don't expect you to know about it, but um, the government of Alberta has just released the South Saskatchewan Land Use Plan, and they're inviting all Albertans to come and comment on the plan. And um, as I understand it, they are uh, not really supporting watershed protection in the way that many of us think they should be. And any of us who have been to those hearings know that they have them all sort of set up so that it's, it's, um, hmm, it, it isn't yeah. obvious how you're supposed to oppose their plan. So under those circumstances, and this sounds a little bit like all of us wondering under what circum these Alberta circumstances we're supposed to accomplish anything, what's the best way to um, make our opposition heard? Susan. I'm going to take one for Anna here. Oh, this one's really off topic from everyone else. It's about the uh, United Nations right to water. And the United Nations vis-a-vis, -vis, I think it's called the World Water Council and the Millennium Development Goals. And it's very confusing, all these pseudo-organizations. And the only way I can find truth about anything on the internet is I go 
Maud Barlow, and whoever else's <laughs> name is there, or she has her opinion. But I'd like to, there's no, no way for me to find out the truth about these things. Okay. So if you can share it, that'd be great. Well, I'll start uh, with that last question, because I, 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 I describe all of that in the book. For, uh, first of all, the World Water Council I call them the lords of water. This is a, a basically they're the big water companies. It's the World Bank. It's some parts of the UN, some right-wing governments that support them. They've set themselves up as the arbiter of, uh, of global water policy, along with the World Bank. And then the World Bank uh, gives out money in the global south, but under conditions of privatization. So they work very closely together. Um, and they have a world, world Water Forum every three years, and we have invaded their World Water Forum and made big trouble for them ever since the very first one, which was in The Hague back in 2000, and then we, we kept building and building, and the last one was in Marseille a year and a half ago, and we held our own alternative forum. We had over 5,000 people at ours, uh, and I think theirs had gone down from something like 25,000 to something like just five or 6,000 as well, so we're really... I mean, this is how you do it, you know, and this is part of the answer to all the other questions about how we make this balance. You have to persevere, and we have to be there, but the UN is, the World Bank is, is, is um, in my opinion, it should be shut down. It's not, it's not performing any good function whatsoever. The UN is different. The UN is, in my opinion, what I call a contested area. It is the, the place where countries come together to um, try to resolve the crises and issues that, that, that arise between and, are, and around them. Um, there is huge corporate influence around water policy at the UN, but there's also a counter-corporate policy as well that we've been involved in. And that was partly the work that I did when I was advisor to the 63rd president, was we really put out this challenge around the corporate, um, the, the, the corporations uh, and their power. The Millennium Development Goals are goals that were made in the year 2000 by the UN countries um, to, uh, to deal with poverty and in, injustice around the world. The water part of it, they promised to cut in half the number of people without water and sanitation by 2015. So they judge how they're doing. They say that they're actually meeting their goals on water delivery, I don't agree because basically they're only counting pipes that they've put in, but they're not counting whether those pipes are carrying clean water, how far away they are from people, or whether people have to pay for them. Um, they admit that they're nowhere near their, their uh, level on their goals on sanitation. They admit that, that they haven't done well. So it's all kind of mixed up in the sense that there's some good intention around the Millennium Development Goals, but far too much corporate power. And I go after in the book a guy named Peter Brabick. Now, you guys may remember Peter Brabick. He's the CEO of uh, Nestle, which is the big bottled water company in the water, and the company that brought us baby formula. And is still putting the lovely twin issues of baby formula and bottled water, selling them together in the global south. Um, they continue to be awful. Um, and Peter Brabeck used to be an ice cream salesman with, uh, with Nestle and worked his way up, and now he's like king of the world. This guy is out there. He is advising, literally advising, the financial arm of the World Bank on all global water policy. Um, he's very influential at the UN as well. He got an honorary doctorate from the University of Alberta. Uh, you'll remember last year, because he's sitting on an advisory board that's made up of the energy sector and all sorts of private sector interests to advise the university, which in turn advises the government of Alberta. So we had a little welcome party, did we not, Scott, for, uh, for him when he, when he won that? Uh, spoiled his little party a bit, but this is a man who fought tooth and nail against the human right to water and now has relented and said, well, no, I can recognize that there are some, you know, there is some injustice. So I would put 1.5% of the world's water aside for the poor, and the rest of it goes on the open market like oil and gas. That's the, that he found a heart. I mean, I was just, <laughs> like, I just wanted to say hallelujah. You, you found your heart, right? This, so anyway, I take this guy on, gloves off in this book. Um, uh, so we, we really do need to understand who are the powers behind the, the push to circle the world's water to in order to privatize it and and one of the issues here in alberta is the flirting with trade with with water trading um and please anybody wants more on this go to the chapter go to scott um our wonderful uh, organizer um uh, because really this is very very 
this is a very dangerous development, where they went to water trading in, in Australia. Water trading is basically where you convert a license to a property. They call it different things, but it's basically you're then able to, to, to trade, uh, hoard, buy and sell your water. And in Australia, when they did this in 1993, the idea was, well, we're running out of water, these big cotton conglomerates and the big wine conglomerates and so on, they have all these licenses. Maybe if we let them buy and sell them, they'll use less water and then they'll make a profit from selling the extra. That was the thinking. What happened was the big conglomerates bought the small farmers. Then the investors came in. Then the global investors came in. And then they had all these cowboy um, brokers who they had no rules for these guys. They were making money hand over fist. The, the price of water shot up. Ten years later, when a labor government tried to buy back water, for the Murray Darling, which was just desperately in need of it, they couldn't afford it. And this is a, a this may be an extreme story, but it's a story, and it's a story in Chile, it's a story in Texas, where T. Boone Pickens, the gazillionaire energy guy, is buying up huge amounts of the Ogallala Aquifer, sitting on it, and now he's selling the, this water to developers. This should not be allowed to happen, and it's really important we not allow this to take two baby steps in, in this province because they, this, is, this place is ripe for that kind of, of, uh, of privatization. I know that's not the question you asked, but I've... The other questions all kind of are part of, 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 of one question, which is at this, at the South Saskatchewan land use plan, I've heard of it, but I, uh, there are people, Scott and, and Mel and Joan and others here who can answer that you better, but I do know that it is not a watershed sharing arrangement as we, as we need to do it. And for that, I would look to, to Europe, where they, in 2000, they did bring in a, a European-wide watershed management and watershed governance um, uh, uh, agreement. Um, and all watersheds, and most of them pass at least two countries, a lot of them three or four, because the countries are small there compared to here. Um, they All waterways, all watersheds have to be governed on a watershed basis. And it's had mixed results, but some very exciting results. One, Lake, Lake, Lake Constance has been brought back from the brink, as a, as a matter of fact, but uh, there'd be people who could answer that specific question. But yours and the others on, wa on workers and how to speak to workers and, and how to, um, how to, ha how to uh, deal with the issue of, of good public money going uh, to, to the private, you know, to, to promote these private interests. It all just takes organizing. I mean, the workers want to work in safer conditions. I mean, you've spoken to them, I've spoken to them, I've spoken to workers in, in Fort McMurray who can't bring their families here. Their families have to stay back in Newfoundland or New Brunswick because they're afraid to bring them because they don't want them breathing that air. The workers want would, would, in my opinion, would choose a safer job, a safer environment, but those aren't the jobs that exist. So it's really important that we don't in any way vilify the workers or see them as, as part of the, the enemy, if, if you will, that we have to work really closely with our labor friends and with workers in, the, in these sectors, including workers in the fracking sector, um, to work together to promote policies that are going to take us in a, a more sustainable direction. And I recognize how hard it is here in Alberta. I mean, it's hard everywhere. I was just in Saskatchewan. We were there for our AGM in Saskatoon, and Saskatchewan is kind of vying for Alberta with the title of the most right-wing province in Canada right now. But it was the same in the Northwest Territories, it's the same in New Brunswick, it's the same in Quebec with their northern development. This is a time when we are going to see massive, massive resource grabs. This is a time of, of uh, a real struggle now around who is going to set these, the, the tone for this. And I, I have to believe that we have to have hope. I believe hope is a moral imperative. Um, and if the, we speak these truths to each other and we speak them very clearly tomorrow and we speak them at the march on, this, on the 2nd, um, we, will, we will be heard. And I have as many stories of hope as I have of despair, and we have to keep those stories of hope um, in front of us. Okay, we'll, we'll take another round here. I, I just, uh, I'm pretty good at math, I think. So, Ahmad, I think you said 70,000 tons of beef. Yeah, is what they're hyping, right? So, being a farmer, 
and haven't been to a lot of water meetings in the course of my life. Not exactly all on the farm, but for for a ton of beef, it basically a dressed out would take at least two animals, at least. Now that's just from my farm experience. And so that means that you need 140,000 steers or, or, or cattle to go to market to create 70,000 tons. An average steer in a feedlot drinks 14 times what a person does. So if you multiply that times 14, you end up with 2,160,000 people. So for 70,000 tons of beef, you need a city the size of Vancouver to quit drinking water. It's sort of quite interesting when you think about that. But, but this whole CETA stuff and Harper with his employment numbers and his beef numbers are so inflated, so unbelievable when you get down to the facts, but I thought I'd point that out. Uh, the South Saskatchewan uh, Land Use Review is in its uh, third phase, I think, and reviews are coming forth. Uh, I have a note on that, and I'll make sure to send it out on email to everyone so they know when the Calgary review meetings are. So thank you for that, Maud. Okay. And I, and I want those numbers. I want oh, those. okay. <laughs> I want those. <laughs> Troy? Hi, Maud. Uh, Troy. Um, Maud, thank you for all the work that you're doing. It was because of the meeting maybe three or four years ago that I heard you speak that I got connected to the Council of Canadians and I'm now passionately trying to figure out how to make a difference in all of this. You have uh, described this scenario where we cannot allow the water to be privatized for all the reasons that you've listed. And yet part of the rationale that people are using for this water license, this, this privatization maneuver, is that the only way to stop overuse of water is by giving it a value so that people know that it, it's valuable. Um, and it, to avoid the tragedy of the commons where it's just out there and you can just use it as you will. Could you speak in your, in your answer to that dynamic, please. David? Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Maud, for, uh, for joining us here tonight and just for all your, for being such an amazing warrior for all of us on these issues. Topic, but I was hoping or wondering if you might like to reflect on the recent uh, anniversary of the free trade agreement. And as a uh, quick aside to that, you were mentioning about all the things that have changed over time and how we can expect uh, change to continue. And I, I just watched the recent National Film Board documentary on your fight against the free trade agreement. And uh, you're still as spry as ever. Um, but it was amazing to me. I noted that the, the language change uh, struck me and um, how much uh, the language at that time seemed to be much more like, almost radical. Like we were, you were really vocalizing these things that I don't think we are explicit about anymore. Corporate power, questioning capitalism, uh, all these things that I'd like that I think have um, sort of gone away from the mainstream question. Eric and on. Thank you. A good question here. Right. Yes. Yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming in today. Uh, what what language can you help us? Um, what language can we use when we're talking about um, water issues and when it ties into large corporations with corporate social responsibility and how that ties into philanthropy, charity, nonprofit, NGOs around the world, feeding the world, how these things come together so that we can, when we're speaking to people about that, so companies like Nestle and Coke who are using stealing water, 
but also have foundations to help people. What language can we use to tie them together? Hi. Um, I saw you speak a couple of years ago in Saskatoon uh, about CETA, and um, I'm just wondering what, how imminent that signing is and what the parameters are, like if there's a time um, for the agreement, how it runs in that way, and why it's not publicized. Like I've only heard it mentioned on the news or in the media a handful of times since I saw you in Saskatoon two years ago. Okay, and these will be the last. <coughs> my, otherwise, my voice will be gone. Um, I'll start with the last one. Uh, CETA has been signed in principle, but it still has to be ratified by all the countries in Europe and by the European Parliament. So we're going to move a lot of our work over there now because we think we have a lot of, of, uh, of support over there. Um, they, interestingly, this kind of, I have this memory. When we fought the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, it was hard to get Americans interested. But then when NAFTA came along and their jobs were threatened by Mexico, all of a sudden they got interested. Well, we're watching that happen in Europe. It's been really hard to get the European progressive movements interested in CETA with Canada because it's just Canada. Now the European Union and the US are talking about a CETA. And now everybody's like, okay, we've got your attention, you know. So I think it's going to open some doors for us because, I mean, for instance, they, the European Union or Europeans have rejected GMO uh, foods, uh, ex exports. Well, they're going to have to give that up. Uh, and the, the United States is very clear about that. So all of a sudden, the food security movement, the health, the, the folks into those issues around health and so on, are all going to get into this, and so I think we're going to enlarge the debate. We won't just be Canada Europe anymore. It'll be it'll be more. Uh, it's hard to get it out in the media. Part of the problem has been that people think, oh, it's Europe, and Europe's nicer than the United States. When we fought the Canada U.S. Free Trade Agreement, it was Ronald Reagan, don't forget, and it was really hard to get people whipped up because every you know Ronald Reagan was so awful. Uh, whereas they look at Europe and they say, well, they've got better labor standards, better environment standards, so it's been a harder fight. And I keep reminding people of two things. First of all, Europe is going through a huge privatization. This austerity agenda is more radical in Europe than it is in the United States, as a matter of fact, and we do not want to emulate that. And number two, it's, it's not with the nice environmental and labor people that we're doing the deal. It's with the corporations of Europe and the corporations of Canada and soon to be the corporations of, of the United States that this deal is, is being developed. It's with them, for them, and by them. And that's very important for us to know those same right-wing forces exist in Europe. But it's been hard to get it out. And uh, I, I understand Amanda Lang on the... On the CBC said the other night said you know something about well you know nobody's interested and Maud Barlow's not even and like where have they been I've been on a national tour with Paul Moist and QP and it's like I eat sleep and breathe this stuff and where have they been it's just you know it, they believe they get this notion in their heads that more stuff more trade more liberalization is good and that's just what they learn in school and they don't ask any questions about the details. When you challenge them, if they know the details, they don't. I can tell you that. On the question of corporate social responsibility, look, I'm all for corporations cleaning up their act in terms of their carbon footprint, their water footprint, and we really challenge corporations to do much better in, in reducing the, their water footprint and, and really answering to it. Some companies globally have taken the carbon challenge quite seriously. Some are beginning to take the water challenge seriously. And I'm talking about corporations or industry that needs water. I'm not talking about bottled water. I'll talk about that in a minute. But all industry needs water. In fairness, they do. Um, and therefore, um, you know, it, it's, you know, it behooves us to work with them to get them to clean up their act. That's a very different thing than giving them the right to, to say who has access to water. That, that's where I put my foot down when... Corporations want to, uh, you know, run the water services or dictate policy. I say no. But if you want to clean up your own act and and use a closed loop water system so that you're reusing and you know you want to come up with uh, good technology, good on you. That's fine. That to me is corporate social responsibility. But a lot of them hide behind the notion of corporate social responsibility to blue wash what they're doing. And the bottled water companies are the worst. They are around the world, they're, do they, you know, they, they fund these, you know, um, um, well, digging wells and anti-poverty this and that, and 
They got uh, uh, Michelle Obama to do this drink water, just drink water campaign, and it's all the bottled water companies. Uh, and they have something called water neutrality, where they claim that they are offsetting their water footprint of the water takings by building wells in Africa or something, and it's just bullshit, you know, truly. I mean, this is just sorry, but there's... So I just think you have to make... One has to make a distinction between an honest attempt to... Uh, to, to really ask the question about what you what your corporation or what your industry is doing to water and what it can do to improve, and I'm, I'm open arms on that. But moving in to dictate water policy, to privatize water around the world for personal profit, that's a very different story, and I think we need to make that distinction. So that leads me to the first question, which was around pricing water. Oh, and it was, it was, uh, uh, it was over here, Troy around pricing water, I've got a whole chapter in here dealing with this because I really feel our side has to ask, answer the question, how are we going to pay for public water? Our side has, has, has uh, resisted talking about this, but we, we can't just pretend that it's everybody can have whatever they want for free forever. We cannot pretend that. So I think we have to be very specific that what we're talking about when we charge services for the water coming out of your tap, it's for the service it was for the service provision, the public service provision of that water. Like you pay taxes uh, for your health care. It's not totally free in that sense. We pay taxes, but we believe in progressive taxation. Similarly, with public water, we need to do that. That is not the same as, a mar as allowing the market to set the, the amount, and that's a, very, that's a very specific distinction. I also think it's time to start talking about charging industry that is making money from raw water and is often subsidized. British Columbia gives their water away for free. In my province, they charge $3.71 for a million liters to these companies. They turn around, they're making a fortune. We should say, number one, we're going to have a rule about who has access to our water. I'd still say no bottled water. But who does in industry, under what conditions, and you should be paying a royalty fee or a service fee, a license fee, to the people who own it. It, but that's not the same as owning it, and I think so. I want I want for us to have that discussion because right now all the onus is on households, and people are beginning to find those bills are going up and up and up. And the real use, because that's only about nine percent of water use, the rest of it is industrial, industrial agriculture, and so on. And the final question was on NAFTA and um, using language. I think when. I mean, I still would talk about, I call it savage capitalism, but I certainly still name the, the systems that we're dealing with. Um, NAFTA, the follow-up from NAFTA, I continue to, you know, again, you get, you get people who just say, well, blindly, isn't it, isn't it, didn't it prove to be good? Look, we lost control of our energy sector. I mean, we became, as Elizabeth May calls us, America's gas tank. It is illegal to discriminate against a request for export to the United States, you have to treat those as if they're domestic. We went to a world price, we stopped being able to set environmental standards on our energy export, so, and the same thing would happen to water, by the way, if we ever started exporting it for commercial purposes. Uh, look at what wages, where, where wages are for working people, and where, you know, these, these trade agreements, I mean, this, this whole neoliberal agenda, there were, in two, the year 2000, there were 111 billionaires in the world. Today, there are 1,148, 448 billionaires in the world. I mean, we are skewing the the economic equilibrium with the uh, allowing this kind of power to to rise to the top. So I I stand by my original analysis of NAFTA. I think that it has been bad for ordinary people. I think it's been bad for families. I think it's given them the tools to cut. Uh, not only the regulatory frameworks, but to, t to cut Social Security. I mean, it's not in the name of NAFTA, but it's in the name of the same agenda that brought us NAFTA. Um, and, has, and I think that what Stephen Harper's doing is the logical extension of what Brian Mulroney started. And I, I stand by my analysis. I will always think that it was a, a terrible mistake, and I still hope that we'll undo at least the parts of it that we can um, uh, and keep fighting. Thank you guys so much. Wonderful evening.